Hello, Anita. Hi, Lilu. How are you? Good. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you in person after everything that I've heard about your story and the miracle of, of you being alive right now. I know. It feels great. And I'm so excited to be interviewed by you. Thanks to Wayne Dyer. He's such a beautiful spirit. Oh, Wayne Dyer is absolutely amazing. Interviewing him was a miracle uh, on the Jesus Living Tour when I was in Hawaii meeting him and and um, what a beautiful soul he is and he spoke so highly of you he gave me right during this interview at the end of the interview your full story printed out and I read it and I'm like I have to meet this Anita I have to uh, get to know her and and really share your story with the world as many people as I can because there's so many beautiful lessons really you had a major near-death experience one where well 30 you we had only 36 hours to live, right? You were yeah, at, a, absolutely. Tell us, at best 36 hours. Um, tell us it, about your cancer, because you had a cancer already for many years, but you were only given a few hours. There was billions of cancer cells in your body, and yet they disappeared quite miraculously, huh? Yeah, they did. Um, well, actually, I had cancer for almost four years, and... Um, and then and it, I was diagnosed in 2002, and it was lymphoma, and it started to spread. At first, I really didn't want to have any chemotherapy because I was really scared of chemotherapy. I'd seen two people die who were on chemotherapy. So, um, But the cancer, unfortunately, spread, even though I was trying a lot of different alternative things. And I'm looking back on hindsight, I know that the major reason was because of a lot of fear that I was going through at the time. Um, but at the end of 2005, I had a, a body scan and the, and the doctors told my husband, they didn't tell me, they told my husband that I had three months to live at best. They said that's at best. But um, six weeks later, I fell into a coma. But during that time, even before falling into a coma, I was already, um, like I couldn't walk. My muscles were all completely wasted. I was completely emaciated. I had huge open skin lesions. Um, I was breathing with the aid of an oxygen tank. I couldn't breathe unaided. Um, my lungs were filled with fluid, so I was constantly coughing and choking. I couldn't walk because my muscles had deteriorated. Uh, if I went out, my husband would have to take me in a wheelchair. And even though I was being treated uh, in and out of hospital, I didn't want to stay in hospital, so I was going home and then I had a full-time nurse, but on the morning of February the 2nd, I didn't wake up, mm -hmm. and, it, and apparently my body completely swelled up, and my husband called my doctor, and he said to just rush me to the hospital, and so, my, and the doctor said to rush me to, it was a different hospital, it was like one of the best cancer clinics in Hong Kong, so my husband rushed me to that hospital. And when I went into that hospital, the doctors uh, basically said that this was it. I was dying. And it's even written in my medical records that they informed my family that this was it. I wasn't going to come out of the coma. And these were my last few hours. Mm -hmm. It would be 36 hours at the most. That was all I had. And they said my organs had now shut down. And that's why I was in the coma. And that's why my body had completely swelled up because my organs had stopped functioning and so all the toxins were building up and my skin lesions were they were weeping because they were um, because the toxins were coming out of the skin lesions um, so I was in like a really bad state and the doctor said that um, I had tumors like the size of lemons from the base of my skull all the way down like under my arms and uh, down my chest and all the way down to below my abdomen wow. And, and my brain was filled with fluid as well. Mm. And so there was like no chance at all. But while everybody thought that I was in a coma, um, I was just in this really, really beautiful place. It was, um, I mean, it was really, really amazing. And I was aware of everything that was happening around me. Mm. I was aware of um, my family being really distraught and, and, and actually it's quite emotional because 
I didn't understand why they were so distraught because I was feeling so good. I was feeling, I was feeling really free, like all that pain of all and all that suffering from the last few years of having the cancer and and all the pain in my body and everything, I was free from it. I felt really light, really, really light. And then I felt as though I was like surrounded by what I can only describe as unconditional love. Mm. Um, it's, it's more than that. I mean, even the word love, it just doesn't do justice to it. It, it was, it's like, it's like a feeling like you're home. You know, it's very, very comforting. And, and it was a very welcoming and comforting feeling. And I was aware that uh, I, I could see and hear and feel everything that was happening and not even what was around me, but um, I, I saw the doctors telling my husband and my mom who was there that, that, this, that my organs had shut down and, and that was it, I was dying. Mm -hmm. They called my brother to tell him to come, he was not in Hong Kong, and they called him to tell him I was dying and that he better rush over. Now, my brother, uh, even before he got the call from my husband, he already sensed something was wrong. So he already started booking a flight, and he couldn't get a flight in the town he was in, so he actually hired a car to drive three hours to the next town to get a flight, and there was a sense of urgency that he just wanted to come and be here with me. and. And while I was in that state, I was even aware of my brother and what he was doing and, and him getting on the plane and coming to see me. And then I had this feeling that I don't want to die before he comes here. I don't want him to see my body just laying there dead because that would be quite distressing for him. And I just had that feeling that I didn't want to do it. I kind of, my brother's older than me, but I, I sort of just felt a sense of protectiveness over him. And a lot of what happened while I was in that state is quite confusing because it didn't feel like time runs linear. It feels like everything was happening at the same time. Like whatever I brought into my awareness, it was happening in front of me. You know, whether I was thinking, whether I brought my husband into my awareness he was there, and I and I understood my purpose with him. I understood that his purpose and my purpose was linked, and we were meant to be in this life together. And if I I understood that if I died, he would die as well. He would follow me soon after. Um, he wouldn't be able to fulfill his purpose. And I um, and then I became aware of my father. His presence was just around me because my father had passed away 10 years before that and um, my you know and, and um, at the time when I was growing up I used to have a lot of um, I would say differences with my father because he's quite orthodox Hindu and I used to rebel against it like he'd wanted me to have an arranged marriage and I didn't mm. so there were a lot of orthodox like a lot of differences but in that state it was really amazing. It's like we're without our culture, we're without our egos, without our bodies. And I felt nothing but unconditional love from him. How um, amazing. Yeah. So that was, it was so like. You were surrounded really, or you could bring in your, in that space, the people that you love and wanted to be with and see. It was really effortless. Boom. As soon as you had that thought, they were there and you were experiencing them from an unconditional point of view absolutely yes because it was like um, thoughts if you can even call it thoughts it was like awareness you bring something into your awareness and it's instant instantly it's just there it's happening it's right in front of you there's no time lapse and and even coming back into this realm it's very hard to put everything into a sequence because it all felt like it was happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was even aware of other lives. It was as though I had lived other lives, but I was watching those lives, not like they were past lives, but like they were actually happening there in front of me. So it's like all of time exists at the same time. There is only now, there is only the present moment. And 
everything is happening at the present moment, the past, the present, the future, because I saw the possibility of the future of whether I lived or I died. I saw both possibilities and it could have gone either way. And you had a choice. I had a choice of whether I wanted to come back or not. And, and at first I really didn't want to come back. Um, I didn't want to come back because it felt so good. It was just, yeah, it felt really good. And, and, and I didn't want to come back to that heavy, burdensome, sick body. I mean, the body was just, my body was so wasted. I just thought there was no use. And, and that body was not just causing me pain, but it was causing pain for my whole family to see me like that. It was causing pain. My husband, who was caring for me, my mother. So I really didn't want to come back. And when I, was, when I had the thought of not coming back, it was like I saw that happening, that I, I hadn't come back. And then the, the doctors actually telling my family that I had died because of organ failure due to end-stage cancer that had spread. And so um, I, I actually saw that happening and then the, my distraught family. But so, then, were, so the doctor, you're saying, announced you were dead and the line was flat and the, your heart was not beating anymore and you were gone, medically gone. I was medically gone, medically gone. And then, um, but at the same time, I also, see, this is why it's so hard to put it all into sequence because I also started to get this understanding of why I got the cancer in the first place. Mm. I started to understand that the cancer was like a culmination of everything I was up to that point in life. And, and I had always been um, very fearful. Like I'd always feared letting people down, disappointing people. Uh, I had a lot of fears. You know, I feared cancer. I feared chemotherapy. I feared, uh, I feared eating the wrong foods you know, foods that cause cancer. And uh, I just lived a really fearful life. And everything that I did in life, I did out of fear, not out of love for myself or love for my body or love for who I was. But I did it out of fear, out of a fear for the consequences. Mm. And, and so I just completely understood that my life was just a culmination of fearful thoughts and it was everything, like right from the time I was a child, you know, whether it was fear of religion and fear, all kinds of fears. It's like even our spiritual beliefs and our religions, they're supposed to be um, empowering and, and uh, inspiring and make us feel love, not fear, not fear of death and fear of the afterlife and fear of punishment or fear of bad karma and all these things. And that that's... That's not right. We're not supposed to interpret religion that way. Yeah. So it's just the clarity was just amazing. I just felt this incredible clarity as to why I had the cancer and how all this fear had accumulated in my energy and in my physical body and, mm -hmm. and then creating illness in the end, like maybe through creating blockages in my body. And I realized that we're not supposed to live a life of fear. We're actually amazing, magnificent beings. And at our core, that's what we are. We are amazing, magnificent spiritual beings who are supposed to just live our truth and express who we are. And we're not supposed to be afraid to be who we are. We're not supposed to be pretend to be something else. And and I realized that um, that I'd always been afraid to be who I am. Mm. And that's when I started to understand or realize that, that you know, we're, we're magnificent. And basically, I, I also felt the connection that all of us are actually connected. We're all one. We're all part of one consciousness. You know, we are all facets of God. We can call it whatever we like, but we are all one consciousness. We're all one and we're all connected. I started to also feel um, 
as I was aware of what was happening, like, uh, to my body and my family that was around me and my brother who had arrived in Hong Kong, I started to realize that I was able to feel all their emotions. Once I was without my body, from that perspective, it's like um, our bodies make us feel separate. But without the body, we're not separate. We're all one. Whatever I do, whatever I feel affects you and it affects everybody. And so in that state, it's very, very heightened. And I could feel everything that every doctor and every nurse was feeling. Um, I could feel everything that my brother, my mother, my husband, whatever they were all feeling. It was like I could feel their emotions. Was it, was it because you wanted to or was it just coming to you? It was just coming to me. It was just coming to me, but it was like, as soon as my awareness was on them, I was feeling it. If my awareness was not focused on them, then I wouldn't feel it. But whatever I, or whoever I focused my awareness on, I became, it's like you become them, because it's like when, um, when I was, see, you can imagine how difficult this is because our language just doesn't have the right words. Well, you're doing such a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm sure it's limiting for you, but for us it opens up really a lot. So, uh, and, and you've shared your story, so I know that more is you're able to formulate it in some ways that you were probably not able to before. So it's, it's such a blessing. Thank you. I, I just hope to be able to help other people who are listening. Mm -hmm. It's like when, it's like our body restricts us and without our body, we can be everywhere. Or I felt as though I was everywhere at the same time. You know, I was here, there and everywhere, not restricted to one spot. And because there's no restriction, there's no boundary. I mean, there's this sense of amazing freedom. And you're not even restricted, you're not restricted by time, space, boundaries, walls, but you're not even restricted by other people's physical bodies because the only thing that's real is our emotions. It's love, it's our emotions, it's what we feel. That's the only thing that's real. And that was what I felt from each person, was their emotion. Mm. It's like you go beyond the body. So when I bring, when I was, whenever I had my awareness on anyone, it was beyond their physical body. All so, I felt was their emotion. So was it, were you connected directly to their soul or were you seeing also their physical perspective, their pain and suffering from you having passed away? I was like, I was able to feel their emotions, what they were feeling at that time. Um, to an extent, and this carried on because even after I came out of the coma, this, the, the feeling didn't just disappear for the many weeks subsequent to that. I mean, even while I was in the hospital and while the doctors were treating me and the nurses were treating me, um, I was just, um, I could just feel that whatever they were doing, they felt they were doing what was best. I could just feel nothing but compassion for them. It was like I knew them. I felt as though I knew them. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in fact, I'm jumping ahead, but, but the doctors were conducting tests, which I didn't want them to conduct. And I was telling them, you don't need to conduct any more tests because I know I'm fine. I know you're not going to find anything. Hmm. I, you're just doing it to satisfy your own mind. You're not doing it for me. But at the same time, I felt a level of compassion towards them for needing to do this. <laughs> um, and I let them, and I just let them, and I thought, I know I'm fine. Uh, and so I'm just going to let them because I know now that I'm really invincible. Mm -hmm. And you were able to verify some information later, but tell us about that choice first before coming back and everything that happened afterwards. Tell us, because it's... It's quite um, spectacular. <laughs> um, so I was, then what happened is that I realized I had a choice 
of whether to come back or not, as yeah. I mentioned. Yeah. And first I chose that I didn't want to come back. And then when I started to understand the magnificence of who we really are and who I really am and that my purpose hadn't been fulfilled, I then felt my father again and um, he was really key in this because he said to me, um, he communicated to me, he said that um, it's not your time yet, you should go back. And mm. I felt at that time, in that moment, I felt, I don't want to go back into that body. I really don't want to go back. It's too painful. And then in that moment, I seemed to understand, and it could have been my father communicating this to me, or, um, you know, it could have been the, the source that connects all of us. But I seemed to immediately in that moment understand that now that I knew the truth of who I am, and what my purpose is, that my body would heal very quickly, that my body would just reflect this truth, that the body is not the real me. Mm -hmm. Now that I've discovered the real me, who I really am, the body would just reflect that. And I seemed to understand that. And um, I also felt the presence of many other beings, including my best friend who had passed away from cancer. I felt her presence and, and I had missed her a lot before then, but um, she was there and it was just really good to see her, to, to sense her there. And I sensed her presence and she was like really at peace, totally at peace and that felt really good because mm -hmm. it was like feeling like you're embraced, you know, and, and just being like you, you're surrounded by this ocean of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and then I came to a point where my father actually said to me, this is as far as you can go. Oh. He said, if you go any further than this, you won't be able to turn back. And he said, now I want you to go back. Go back and live your life fearlessly. And it was after that, that I started to wake up from the coma. Mm. And then in that moment, were you told, um, I thought you were told that all the reports will be clear and everything will be clear, or did you come to that understanding as you were choosing? That was part of my understanding as I was choosing, as I started to understand, as I started to understand that, um, my body would reflect would mm -hmm. reflect the the truth what i now knew which was the truth of who i really am i then started to realize that or i started to understand that my body would heal but not just heal but it would heal very rapidly and it would be a total healing i really i understood that and i and i also understood that i had a purpose but i understood that i wouldn't have to work hard at figuring out my purpose. I just had to be myself and allow, and the purpose would unfold before me. Mm. What and a I beautiful just... lesson for all of us. Another one. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, I, and that was the biggest thing I learned, was that I just had to go and be myself and live life with abandon, and my purpose would unfold before me. Mm. Just have to allow it, that's all. Not pursue it, but allow it. So from what I read too, Anita, you had a sense of, or you still have a sense of being invincible. Yeah, Tell well... Tell us more about that. It's been an amazing journey because everything I felt and sensed has just been confirmed after I came back because as I started to awaken, I was in a real blur when I started to come out of the coma. I was, I, it was like I had one foot on each side. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand what was happening. Um, and then I saw my brother was there. My, my husband was really ecstatic and he was, he had been whispering to me all through while I was in the coma. He was like whispering, standing, he was by my side. He never left my side 
because he didn't want to miss in case I had my last breath. And he'd been whispering that I'm waiting for you, come back, come back. And um, when I came out of it, he was there, my mom was there, my brother was standing there. And then when I saw my brother, I said, I said, hey, um, I knew you were here, you made it. And then he, he's, he looked at me and he said, how did you know? And, uh, but, but he was like smiling when we were, they were kind of like really happy saying, she's awake, her eyes are opening. And they started to call the doctor. And the doctor was a doctor that I had never seen before I entered the hospital in the coma. So when he came in and I called him by name, I said, you know, good morning, Dr. Chan. And first he said, oh, wow, you're, you're up. I'm so glad. And then he said, but how did you know my name? And I said, aren't you the doctor that, uh, that, that saw me when I came into the hospital? And he said, but you were in a coma. Your eyes were closed. You, how could you, you couldn't have seen me. And I said, I was, I really had no idea I was in a coma because I could see everything. I said, I was in a coma. I really had no idea. And, um, and then he said, I came in to tell you good news. I came in to tell you that your organs have started functioning. And, um, and, I, and I looked at him and I said, but I knew that already. And he said, what do you mean you knew that? And, then, <laughs> and my family, <laughs> and family was, were, were like really happy. They looked at him and they said, they are? And he said, yeah, it's, it's um, really unusual. It's, it's miraculous. We never expected this. And that's really good news. And so then he just looked at me and he said, you better just get some rest. And, and then he, he left the room. And I said to my family, why did he look so shocked? Isn't he the doctor? Telling them that, yeah. And I started telling them everything. I said, you know, he's the doctor that, um, that told you that I was going to die, that I don't have more than 36 hours. And, and my family said, but how did you hear that? My husband said, he said that to us outside the room. We weren't even in this room. And I said, are you sure? But I heard it. And then I, and then I said, are you sure I was in a coma? Because... At four in the morning, I started choking and coughing, and then you and I, you, my husband, um, you went and called the doctor. You called the nurses, and then they made an emergency call to the doctor, and then he took out fluid from my lungs, and I described the whole thing. And they were saying, you, how could you have seen that? They had no idea that I knew every single thing. And I even described to them how one of the male nurses had said, um, like we can't find any veins and anyway, um, she's really emaciated. I don't think she's going to make it. He basically, um, had an air of like giving up on me. Like he wanted to give up. And I actually mentioned this in my book and then, and I mentioned this to, and I, and I told him that. And then my brother was actually really annoyed when he heard that. And he said, Oh, I'm going to go have a word with him and tell him not to be so insensitive. Mm. And when he told them, <laughs> that man, the male nurse was really shocked. He said, I had no idea she could hear me. And he came in and he apologized profusely. Um, so it's, um, they were all really, really surprised. But then what happened is that, um, they, they then started to tell me, okay, uh, you know, it, we're going to have to start treating you and, and, and taking tests to see the progress of your cancer. Uh, and we're going to wait till you're a little bit stronger because your body is really, really weak. And so within about uh, four days, though, I had wanted them to, I was, you know, on oxygen. Actually, within two days, I was telling them, I don't need this oxygen. It's getting in the way, you know. So I was like taking it off. And so they were, they tested my breathing and they said, it's okay, we can take it off. Then I told them, I want to take out the food tube because I had a food tube down my throat so they could feed food directly. I said, it's really uncomfortable. It's scratching my throat. I want to eat some real food like oh. ice cream. <laughs> and so um, they, they reluctantly took that out. But I started to have... Um, a little bit of recollection. Interestingly, it was, I was still quite confused and I started to realize something had happened and I started to um, re understand why I was feeling euphoric because I was feeling really euphoric and at first I didn't understand why. And I was telling my family, 
that I know I'm going to be okay. Why is everybody so worried? It's going to be fine. I'm really going to be okay. But everybody was being really cautious. Um, but by the fourth day, the doctor actually said that my tumors had shrunk by 60 or 70 percent just to the touch, wow. just by touching my neck. I still had the open skin lesions, so I had bandages and all. But because um, I was like really euphoric and the swelling had gone down and the tumors had gone down and I wanted to sit up and I wanted to listen to music because I love music. Mm. And I told my husband, um, could you please bring me my iPod? I really want to listen to music. And so he connected my, my iPod and I couldn't put the earphones in because of all the tubes and wires and I had some bandages. So he connected up little speakers and so I was listening to dance music and I was having my husband, brother, mother visiting me all the time. And in the end, the other patients, because I was in an intensive care unit, the other patients started complaining about me. And their families started complaining about me, saying that, what is this woman doing in here? Because people here are really sick. They're dying. Wow. <laughs> so the doctor had to, um, he moved me out of intensive care by the fourth day and into a regular room. And then my healing was just really, really rapid after that. And um, they, they wanted to, they did a, um, um, what they call a, a biopsy of the spine, where they take out the fluid from the spine, which is really, really painful. Mm. And when they did that, um, when they did that operation, they, they didn't find any cancer. In, in the spine and then they did a lymph node biopsy and they didn't find any cancer in the lymph node and uh, they just kept poking and looking for cancer because they didn't believe it was gone. And for you, so you had this like invincible, I'm, I'm back, uh, nothing can stop me type of way of, it is just you are living life again so fast, so rapidly. So they, everybody must have been so surprised. And what a change that creates in one's life. Did you start to have immediate conversations with other people and about it's, this experience and with doctors? And oh my God, I have hundreds of questions now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I love answering questions. It took me a little while to unravel it because I was quite confused you know when people were shocked by by what had happened my own doctor my own doctor oncologist who treated me um, he made the gesture of throwing my my file my medical file in the bin he actually said to me I don't know what to write in your medical file and he made the gesture of as though pretending to throw it in the dustbin. He said, I really don't know. I don't even know what to make of you. That's what he oh, said oh. to me. And um, I went through a phase uh, of being a little bit confused after that, of not knowing what to make of it, what happened. Um, I really didn't know because I didn't know, like, was it, was it my higher self? Is it, what is it? Like, is it God? What is it? And, um, and for me, like these beliefs like that, like for me, if I use the term God, I can say it was God, but God has no form. God is formless. The minute you put form on God, again, you've put limitations. There is no such limitation. So I didn't have a complete understanding of what to attribute it to. But I knew that something big had happened, something really, really huge had happened. And I had connected to something, and I knew I'd connected to something. And that something that I connected to made me feel as if I was that something in that state when I was without my body. Mm -hmm. I was also part of that something. I was everything. I was invincible. Mm. And... And I was connected to every body and every living thing. It was like I became everything. I became the universe in that state. So you start realizing that you had the universe inside of you. Yeah, you have the universe inside of you. And we all do. And we all do. We all do. We are all at the... It feels as though we are all at the center of the universe. And 
And when we find that place, that center place, when you find that center place of the universe, and that's what to me meaning, um, meaning getting centered to me means finding your place at the center of the universe. And it's when you find that place that you can start allowing everything that is truly yours to enter into your life. And everything that you get, like all the amazing things that can happen to you, they're truly yours. When you're at that center place, that's when you can just allow them to come in. So it's not about pursuing, because the minute we talk about pursuing something or going after something, the fact that you feel you need to go after it means you don't really think it's yours in the first place. Mm. But when you're at that centered place, then everything that is yours just comes to you. You just have to allow it. And that's, that's kind of what I discovered. Yeah, this is, this is uh, very different than how most of us have been brought up. And I guess how you've been brought up. So now, how, how do we really create our reality? Is there really anything for us to do or just relax in this place, knowing that all is well? In many ways, it's the latter. It's about really relaxing. And the journey to creating our reality is, to me, is the same as the journey to discovering ourself. Because the more you know who you really are, the more you will allow that which is truly yours to come into your life. Because you, once you know that you are an amazing, magnificent being, that is worthy and deserving of everything that, that you desire. Once you know that you are worthy and you deserve love, unconditional love, in the way that you desire it, you only have to realize it and allow it in. Because we seem to believe that we have to compete. It's like, oh, how can everybody's desires be fulfilled? It's like, how can you get what you want and I get what you want? There isn't enough to go around. But we're all different. What you want is different from what I want. And the, and the universe needs all of us. The reason why we are the way we are is, you know, we are all facets of the universe. We've come here to express who we are. You've come here to be the beautiful Lilu Mace. <laughs> and I've come here to be me. And if I stopped being me, then the universe would be deprived of me. And if you stopped being you, the universe would be deprived of you. So you have to be as you as you can be. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we are not uh, needed. I mean, it, it's like this, it seems to be this fine balance, too, is that our soul... Um, we, we all, so you're saying we all have a purpose. But our... But, but, but at the same time, at the same time as we are those God living beings, you know, facets of gods on this planet, um, the ego at some point can get in too and say, oh, I am needed. But not really, it seems. It's paradoxical, isn't it? Tell me, um, let me see if I understand you co correctly. When you say we're needed, you mean that the the people in the planet needs us, like people need our you. Our purpose, our purpose, each of us needing to find our purpose in life to help the collective all. But we, just, yes, we are helping the collective by following our purpose. As, because if you think of it this way, at our core, let's say if all of us, at our core, at our soul, at our essence, we're pure, but pure what? We're pure love. What else can you be at your core? Because your core, that is your center. That is your God center. That is where we all come from and that is where we all go. That is the point at which we are all connected. So what can that be if it is God, if it is our essence, if it is our soul, if it is our core? What else can it be but pure love? And so... When you get in touch with that, if your only purpose is to get in touch with that, when you're in touch with that, and that is who you are being, 
what else can you be but love? And yeah, what else can you yeah, do? Yeah, and yet there is in many cir in many circumstances, though, um, and that I think that's part of what we fear also not having experienced fully the light is to be all that light because we have seen around us uh, people that because of because of really expanding our life and expanding our reach and expanding our power and what have you then the ego crawls back in and there is this other false identity that starts emerging uh, this identification to self and there seems to be um there's nothing to watch for from and be afraid of from what i'm hearing from you yet it's some it feels like it's something that holds us back from fully unleashing all the light that we have because we've been brought up in this society that there's something wrong if we do that is that is actually the way of, that is the way of duality it's the way that we are in human form yes we all have we all have an ego and that's just um, that gives us our individuality and I think as long as we're expressing through our physical bodies it's diff I don't think that we will escape our egos so the best thing that we can do is to accept our egos mm -hmm. We shouldn't, I don't believe in actually trying to overcome our egos because I think the more we try to suppress our egos, the more our egos will push back. <laughs> so, so perhaps the best thing is just to accept that we are ego beings, physical, yeah. as long as we're expressing in the physical. Because this is why even while we're in physical life, um, we, we're in duality, we all feel separate from each other because we have bodies, physical bodies, we have egos. And this is why people um, feel, they feel separate and they, they compete with each other, they feel fear. This is why we even have crimes and, you know, you have criminals and uh, so, and uh, because people in our physical bodies, we don't necessarily feel all that, the oneness. And so we, we do, it's just something I guess we have to accept while we're here. Mm -hmm. And allow ourselves to experience this unconditional self-love because this is truly your message. Yeah. Unconditional and... self-love. Because you've never felt from what I read so much love, like you know you are loved now and from this place all is possible. Yes. I, what I really want, my real message to people is that at your core, at our core, mine, yours, everybody's, all of us, at our core, it's who we are. We are love. We really are. And so when you are being yourself, when you're totally being yourself, all you can be is love because that's who you are at your core. Mm, wow. And so don't be afraid to be who you are. Yes. Anita, you're such a blessing. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for having the courage to, and, and the love to come back here and share this beautiful message. How long ago was that, this, your near-death experience? It was in 2006. It was five years ago. And now you are physically vibrant and <laughs> all is I'm... well. Your life must have truly transformed. Oh gosh, my life has really transformed um, and the beautiful Wayne Dyer has been part of that transformation. He's just been amazing uh, and a lot of things have happened since then because I wrote about my story on a, um, on a near-death website and people discovered it. Even medical doctors discovered it and approached me and asked to see my records. and have actually flown to Hong Kong to, to meet me and to go to my hospital and to go through my records and have said that whichever way they look at it, I should be dead. So uh, it's been quite amazing. And then the way my story reached Wayne Dyer has been amazing. And, um, and he's put me in touch with you. And uh, he's beautiful because he's going to be writing the forward to my book. Mm, when so. is your book going to be out? It's going to be out at the beginning of 2012. Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> How beautiful. And 
And um, if people watching want to read more, I know that if you just type Anita M N D E on Google, then you'll have a lot more information right there. Do you yes. have a website too now? I do. It's called um, anitamorjani.com. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for this delicious moment. And I cannot wait to fly to Hong Kong to meet you and uh, do this again in person. Um, I'm ready to take a flight. I was ready to, you know, <laughs> as we're, thanks to technology, we can do it through Skype from Boston to Hong Kong. But um, what a delight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs>